to start a day and let God start working in us then through singing. So let's go ahead and take our hymnals. We're going to turn to page 120, God Makes No Mistakes. We'll go ahead and sing both verses and let's stand. I pray that we can say that this morning, that through our lives, through our life, that others will see that God makes no mistake. Take a minute just to think about that. I, I know I don't fall into that category right now, and I pray that someday I will. Let's go ahead and change gears. We'll take your um, beautiful honeybee-covered program. And we'll turn to page three. It's really the first page after the table of contents. And every year we have a theme song. And this year our theme song was gratefully um, written by our church evangelist, Shane Kohlmeyer. I know sometimes it's hard to jump into a song that you don't really know. Um, and I had thought about, well, maybe I'll just sing it for you. But you know what, let's, let's all experience this together. I know the IBC ladies already know this. So we'll go ahead and sing this through two times. The first time, if you say, I don't read music, I don't know what's going on, go ahead and just listen and let the Lord encourage you through that. And please join us the second time through.
have a seat, and before our speaker comes, there will be a special. I want to introduce our speaker uh, today. Her name is Jenny Crichton, and I actually just met her for the first time on Thursday. <laughs> for those of you who were here when Mrs. Comfort spoke, that would have been two years ago, um, I talked to Mrs. Comfort when I was trying to decide on a speaker for this year, and she said, I strongly recommend Jenny Crichton, and she said she truly walks with the Lord. And I would rather have someone recommend a speaker and say those words than say they're funny or, you know, they can hold somebody's attention, whatever. But she said she truly walks with the Lord. And what a compliment. And so I am so thankful that she is here today. Did you figure out who your surprise guest was? Did you see her? Sarah, where are you? Okay, so do you see Sarah? Stand up, Sarah. Sorry. Okay, so Sarah was 
in Mrs. Crichton's, in their church when you got saved. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So that's one reason that that was like a little confirmation from the Lord. You have the right person. <laughs> Sarah, in fact, just moved up to this area recently to Pennsylvania. So how neat is that, that she got to meet her? Also, uh, Mrs. Crichton had breast cancer, and we have uh, at least one person here today that is in the throes of a breast cancer battle. So I know that God brought her our way for such a time as this. And my husband and I have already been encouraged by her and her husband. He was a pastor in Rhode Island for how many years? 38. 38 years. Now they live in Florida. They have five children. I'll let her tell you whatever else she thinks you need to know about her. But we are just really thankful that she's here. And I'm glad you're here. God knew that you needed to be here today, and he knew that you needed to hear her. So just open your hearts, and we're looking forward to what you have to share with us. Many of you don't know me, so I thought I'd tell you a little about the trial I've been going through. I'm sure if you got up here, you could all tell me about your trial that you've been going through. Well, there's this old lady that moved into my house, and every time... <laughs> Every time I pass the mirror, I get a glimpse of her. It's very intimidating. I don't know about you. And you know, I go to the ATM and I take out $100. And it's like, va -voom, it's gone. And I would never, never spend money like that, believe me. But that's not the only thing that's missing from my house. It's food and my favorites, like butter pecan ice cream. And all oh, those chocolate truffles, oh, but they're gone. They're, and, and I never eat sweets like, like that. She must really have a sweet tooth. And then, oh, one of the worst things, well, maybe not the worst. She's been going in my closet. And she goes in my closet, and I don't know what she's doing, but she's making my clothes smaller. So when I put them on, it's like hard to get into them. But she's going to my mailbox. And in my mailbox, she's taken all the print, and she's blurring it. So like I have to squint and see, who is this to? What, what am I supposed to be doing here? But it's my TV. Oh my word, I listen to the TV and it's like mumbles. I'm trying to say what, I, I'm reading lips. But that's not the only thing. She's taken the joy out of shopping. I mean, you know women, we love to shop. And she's taken all the joy out. So, you know, I go to the store and take all the things that I want to be able to get. And then I go into the dressing room. I'm so excited to see what I'm going to put on. And there she is. She jumps right in front. <laughs> now, I thought maybe she had moved to another house because it was a long time I hadn't seen her. But one day I thought, I better go and get my driver's license. It's time. And so I smiled real nice in front of the camera and everything straightened right up. And she jumped right in front of me <laughs> and got her picture taken. Well, I hope, ladies, that um, when she does move to your home, <laughs> that you and I will learn how to grow old gracefully. I'd like for you to turn into your booklets and um, on the session one, please. And I first would just like to say thank you to Sharon. She has been a real source of blessing to me, a real trooper to um, all the t texts and phone calls and be, just be able to keep me in line what's going on and I've truly appreciated that. And uh, thank you ladies for who are here. It's great, Sarah, we'll have to connect. Um, I'd like for us to say something together. I'm gonna to say it first and it was great in the song because it was just what needs to be said. Lord, whatever you tell me to say or whatever you tell me to do, I will obey. Let me say it again. Lord, 
So I'm not saying it to you, I'm not saying it to me, I'm saying it to the Lord. Lord, whatever you want me to say and whatever you want me to do, I will obey. Let's say that together. Lord, whatever you want me to say and whatever you want me to do, I will obey. Um, May that be in our heart. But sometimes, ladies, not just what we ought to change to say, it's what we ought to change not to say and what we ought not to do. And so we need to keep that mind as we go to the Word of God. Before each session, I'm going to give you something to write down in your booklet or in your Bible. And this session, um, what I've chosen are this. The words originate in our heart. Words originate in our heart and reveal our heart's condition. Words originate in our heart and reveal our heart's condition. We're going to look into that a little bit and talk about that a little bit about how our heart has so much um, in there that needs to come out that we need to know what's in there. And then underneath that, so words originate in our heart and reveal our heart's condition. And then underneath that, I want you to put the scripture, Matthew 12, 34, 35. Although the introductory story was not true, there was a day I looked into the mirror and I looked into my eyes and I knew something was wrong with me. We were planning Our Lady Seminar at our church and so I just said, Lord, you know I don't have time for me. But Lord, as soon as the lady seminar are over, I, I promise, I will check it out. I'll go to the doctor. And so um, in April, actually it was April 1st, I had a scheduled mammogram appointment. And I went. And uh, they saw something suspicious. And then on April 13th, I had another mammogram and an ultrasound. And the next day, I received a phone call. Um, I just got, I was working, and I just got into my car from lunch, and I had a lot of CDs in there that my, for my grandchildren. And so the song played, Jesus sticks closer than a brother. Every moment he is near. I know he will never forsake me. He has conquered all my fears. Jesus sticks closer than a brother. On his love I can depend. King of kings, Lord of lords, conquering son. Yes, all of these. He's my very best friend. And I got the phone call. That phone call changed my life. I was diagnosed with breast cancer. But I'm here to tell you today, through trials, God can be able to give us a sweet, sweet testimony that we can be able to share and tell one another. Now I know if you were up here and you were speaking, you could tell about your trial. And actually I want to hear it. I want to hear your words and you share with me what God is doing in your life. Because you know what ladies? God grows us through trials. Now, I guess if we had a choice, we would um, not sign up for them. Or maybe there's certain things we wouldn't sign up for. I didn't sign up for cancer. But you know what? It was okay because God taught me some sweet, sweet things in my life. So I've entitled this session, Treasured Trials Told. And I want you to think for a minute about your trial, that when I mentioned that about you going through a trial, would you call it a treasure? Would you say it was something precious and gifted to you 
that can be used in your life? It's my prayer today that we will take time just to share our trials with each other and give glory to the Lord. Not the, oh me, poor me, feel sorry for me, but give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like for you to turn to the book of Job. For Job is the one who went through what, ladies? A lot of trials, a lot of heartache. And he went through so many things. You know, um, though many Old Testament characters went through a lot of trials, deep trials, yet it was Job who was, um, he requested of God that he would have the, his words penned. And so God did. God penned the words of Job in the book of Job. So 20 chapters out of the 42 chapters of the book of Job are said, spoken, words from Job himself. Let me ask you, I want you to think about this for a moment. If your words, if my words were penned in the word of God, or just in a simple book, and shared with everybody? Well, we go, oh, I wish I wouldn't have said that. Oh, why did I say that? And so today, as we talk about words, may we be able to see, maybe there's some words that I need to delete and some words that I need to add. So the first words that are recorded that Job said is in Job chapter 1, verse 21. And Job said this, naked, came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's written in your booklet. You can see it there. Okay? You can see right there it says, naked came I out of my mother's womb. Now, we can kind of picture that. But naked shall I return. I can't picture that, but it's going to happen. <laughs> but listen to Job's words. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. But he didn't stop there. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. He gave all the praise to the Lord for his life here on this earth. Now, Job was about 70 years old, and he was called the greatest of all the men of the East. He was a righteous and a spiritual man. He was a man whom God could count on because he was sensitive to sin. He sacrificed for his children. He was a prosperous man. He was a well-known man that, yes, he acknowledged that all his wealth came from God, and therefore he dispersed it and gave it to others. But Job also revealed in his life that he feared the Lord. He was a, a moral man, an upright man. Job loved his family. Job, Job loved his neighbors. Job loved the needy and the widows and the fatherless. Job loved the strangers and he loved his friends. But more than all of those he loved, he loved God the most. I wonder if you're here today and you could say that. Oh, I have a lot of people in my life, but of all of them, I love the Lord God the most. This uh, seminar theme is about words. I didn't choose it. The pastor's wife chose it. And yet, you know, ladies, um, I'm changed because of this study. And I hope that you, if you don't get a whole lot from this, that you will go through the word of God yourself and just study words, what the word of God has to say about the word word and look it up and study it in the word of God. So Job's about words. The words of God, God speaks in the book of Job. The words of Satan are in the book of Job. The words of Job's wife, and we're going to talk about her, 
are in the book of Job. And the words of Job's three friends. We've all heard about them. And then, of course, Job's words himself. As we study through the book, I'd like for us to be able to see who has the last word. Now, I'm going, you're going to, I hope you all have a pen. Were they given pens? Okay. All right, get a pen out, ladies, if you need. And then you're going to write in your booklet there, okay? So the term word is defined, and you're going to write in. It conveys a message. So the word message goes in there. Formulates a phrase. Is the utterance of a statement as an expression of an idea. I'll repeat that. Message, phrase, statement, idea. Now we all know that our words can be a command. We do that if you have children. <laughs> our, um, our words can be a promise. If you're married and you went to the altar, you made a promise. Our words can just be passing news on. Our words can be a testimony. And that's what we're going to think about today, about our words being a testimony of what God is doing in and through our life. Job's words, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. Before Job said those words, he experienced a devastating trial in his life. And let's read about that, Job chapter 1 and verse 6. Job chapter 1 and verse 6. And it says, Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Now let me just say this. I'm just going to pause here for a minute. If you do not have a Bible, okay, you have one right underneath. Okay, they're in the front of your seat, okay? And so if you want to get there, there's a Bible in front. We, I have a King James Bible. I'm sure that's what you have there in front of you. So match up with what I'm saying. And so if, it, it'll just be good for you to see the word of God itself. Okay? All right, so verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered, now notice the words, my servant Job, that there is none like unto him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. He hates evil. He loves God. Isn't it something, ladies, that he was pointed out? Now, I want us to just picture for a minute what is happening and, and get the scene because I can see God saying, this is my servant, Job but I can see Satan coming. Now, we have a picture of Satan which isn't really real, you know, red with horns and that curly tail and the, that's not him. But you know what? There is a real Satan. And Satan said, does Job fear God? Hast thou not put a hedge around him? Has that not, like, protected him from bad things happening to him? He says, Thou hast blessed all the works of his hands, and his substance is increased, all because of you, God. If you just take that all away, you know what? He will curse you to your face. Now, Satan's name means adversary. He's an enemy. He's someone who opposes. He's someone who resists God. 
And in the book of Revelation, chapter 12 and verse nine, it says that he is an accuser of the brethren. That means if you are born again here today, that Satan accuses and say, did you see what she did? You, you did see that. that. That was really wrong. Aren't you gonna do something about that, God? Satan is not, um, Satan is limited. But we know that God is infinite and God limits what Satan can do. Thank the Lord for that. Now, Job didn't know about the meeting in heaven between God and Satan. But God allowed Satan to do some things to Job. And the first thing was all ten of his children were killed in the same day. Picture it, lady. But not only that, on the same day, all his livestock, which meant all his wealth, was taken away. It was either stolen or dead. But not only that, all his servants, except for the four who escaped to tell him about all the devastation that's happened, all of his servants but four were killed. And Job's reaction is told us. Let's look in chapter 1, verse 21. And Job says this, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Notice verse 22. And if you got your own Bible, underline it. In all this, Job sinned not, N-O-T, he sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He didn't use his mouth, he didn't use his finger to point at God and say, you've done me wrong. Um, you see, ladies, there's things that happen in our life, I think, sometimes, and we don't know why. We want to know why. But Job was such a godly man that he was willing to be able to see that I am going to keep my integrity, my love for God. I'm going to stay close to God because of who he is. Now, how can such difficult trials as Job experienced become a treasure? It became a treasure because he kept his focus. He kept his focus on the Lord God of heaven. It, remember words originate in the heart? Well, God was in the heart. He was a changed man because of God himself. On your booklet, you're going to write in, Job first looked back. You're writing the word back. Job first looked back. He looked back to his birth. Everything he possessed, God had given it to him. So why should he complain if it was taken away? But secondly, he looked ahead. He looked for at the very end of life when he was going to die. And he thought, well, you know what? All that I have from birth to death, you know what? God's been with me. He's taking care of me. You've probably heard of the poem called The Dash. Anybody heard that? It says, I read of a man who stood to speak at a funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates of the on the tombstone from beginning to the end. He noted first came the date of birth and spoke the following date with tears. But he said what really mattered was the dash between those years. For the dash represented all the time that he spent on earth and how he had loved those who he loved and known that this little line was worth all of what he had done. For you see, it matters not how much you own, 
the cars, the house, the cash. What matters the most is how you spend and live and love and how you spend your dash. So think long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much is left that still can be arranged. If we could just slow down a bit to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel, be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love people in our lives like we've never loved them before. If we treat each other with respect and wear a spell more often, remembering that special dash might be just a little while off. So when your eulogy is read, when life's action is rehashed, would you be thankful for the things that you've said and how you spent your dash? Thirdly, on your paper, Job looked up. Job's words uttered the foundation of his faith. His faith was in God alone. The Lord God hath given, and the Lord God hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, ladies, um, when everything's going smooth, then we have smooth days, right? We have good days, great days, all smiley and happy days. And on those days, isn't it just great? We can say, praise the Lord. The Lord's so good. I'm so excited what he's doing in my life. But on the days when we get a news, get the phone call, on the days when we wake up and we don't feel well, um, on those days, can we still say, thank the Lord. Praise your holy name, Lord. You see, Job's words stated the foundation of his faith. It's easy to say words when all is going well, but it's hard to say words when things are taking maybe a turn as we would see it, humanly speaking, for the worst. Job did not curse God, as Satan had said. Note in your Bible, the word Lord is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The word Lord is there, and it means Jehovah God. It means the I am, I am. It's talking about the all-existent one, the God who has no beginning and no end. Ladies, the God we worship, the God we love, the, lo the God who holds our life in his hands. Um, 31 times also the name Almighty is used for God. And that means that he is a sovereign controller of my life. That was the one thing that God really pointed out to me um, that was a treasure to me when I had cancer, that he was in control. He was in control of my life. I didn't have to fear. I didn't have to wonder. God was controlling me. Now, treasures are of value. And so, you know, um, Sharon gave us this great, beautiful treasure chest. And treasures are different treasures to people. If, um, I had, if you were kids, and I said, oh, kids, you know what? I got candy today. Oh, they'd be so excited. Oh, candy, that's my, fa oh, th that's my favorite Tootsie Rolls. Can I have that one? But you might not be that excited. But if I took out, a, like, a truffle, you say, oh, okay, now you're talking my story. I, 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 that, that's, that could be a treasure to me. <laughs> Maybe some of you... Um, have a safety deposit box or a special place where you put things that maybe your grandmother or your great-grandmother that they had given you. And so maybe you have a necklace that's just really special to you that you call it a treasure. Well, I have a treasure, 
and the treasure is this journal. This is the journal that I kept while I had cancer. So every day I would write a little something in it. Uh, in your um, booklet there, there is, and you don't have to look for it now, but there is, um, I've printed out a treasure. It's called Journaling Your Journey. And so it's just kind of helping you to just have a little format, some things to write down when you are going through maybe a trial, something hard in your life, but maybe just something daily that you want to be able just to keep track of what God is doing in your life. Now, if we don't journal, it doesn't mean God's not working. Because, lady, isn't God working in our lives every single day when we are born again? When we know Christ as our Savior, he's working in our lives every single day. But I have some, um, I want to just write a couple or read a couple of my treasured things. Um, on May 11th, I wrote this. Today is the day of my biopsy. And last night, I asked the Lord to give me a verse to hold on to today. And my study in the word trust sent me to Psalm 34. I love those verses. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I so desire to be a joyful Christian, I wrote, in my countenance and in my words. Then I came to verse 4. Those are my sister's words. I sought the Lord. And he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. But as I continued, verse 22 really spoke to my heart. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servant, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. I fell asleep, wondering what the word desolate meant. In the morning, I looked it up, and this is what it means. Without hope, God will not leave me without hope. God will not forsaken me or abandon me or cause me to be lonely or deserted or appear to be sad. I needed that verse for God to do something in me that I could not do myself. It had to be supernatural. You see, ladies, that's why I kept a journal, that I could be able to tell a testimony of what God is doing and has done in my life, and that it become a treasure to you. But let me just say, Job's trial became a treasure because he was confident in whom he believed. It, his belief revealed his faith. If you're here today, and you do not know for sure Jesus Christ is your own personal Savior. There has not been a day in your life when you have bowed and told him that you are a sinner and that you needed him to be your Savior. Then in, that, in the booklet, there is some pages back there that explain the gospel message that you too can be able to know Christ as your Savior. Because you see, ladies, the book of God is to tell us how to become a believer, a Christian. And then it's for us to feed on after that. And as we feed on the word of God, all of those things that come into our lives, we can go back to it and God can feed us and nourish us and encourage us and give us hope. Have you ever been hopeless? I have, but you know what? God, through his word, showed me what hope was. Job experienced a second trial, and the second trial is in chapter 2, verse 1. It says, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them also and presented himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro to the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to Satan, hast thou concerted my servant Job? 
that there's none like him in the earth. For he is perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and escheweth either evil, and still he holdeth fast in his integrity, although thou movest me against him. He did not curse you. He destroyed him without cause. That day, God gave permission to Satan to touch Job's body. And he had from head to toe all boils. Now, I don't know if you've just had one boil, but it hurts. Can you imagine head to toe? So Job um, goes outside of the city, and he sits outside the city in the city dump. Now, um, the city dump is where we burn trash, right, ladies? And so it was a place where outcasts gathered. It was a place that smelled horrible, where rats ran around. It was a place where Job sat in a heap of ashes, the Bible tells us. And Job sits there from verse 7 and 8 all the way through chapter to chapter 42. A long time. But Job's wife comes. Now, I can, um, I can just picture her. I mean, if he was a really important man of the East, then don't you think that she was a really important woman? I, I imagine she crept with her flowing gown and her necklaces and all her rings. And I imagine as she passed her expensive stores that, you know, she's going to the city dump to see her husband. And there he sat on a heap of ashes. Can you picture it? Can you imagine? Let us notice her words, verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. And then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, notice verse 10, Thou speakest as a foolish woman speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, if you haven't underlined it, underline it. In all this did not Job sin with his lips. We know that Adam, he listened to Eve's words. We know that Abraham listened to Sarah's words. But Job did not listen to his wife's words. In your booklet, I have a, um, a paper that says, words matter in your home. I hope we realize that. 31 ways to say I love you to your husband. How many of you are married and have a husband at your house? OK, you need to read this, OK? And then it says, 31 ways to praise a child. How many have children? Okay, all right, you need to read this. And you know what, ladies? Our words matter in our home. And so we need to know how to speak. Job's wife did not speak correctly. In your booklet, we're going to be going through the words of a foolish woman and the words of a wise woman. And so I'm going to have you write some things in there. And so, because we know that words have power, we don't want to use the words of a foolish woman. We want to use words of a wise woman. So through the book of Proverbs, 170 times it is mentioned, lips, tongue, mouth, and words. 170 times. I guess it's pretty important that we take note. So I'm going to go through it quickly. I'm not going to go through the scripture. I'm just going to go for what's on your paper, OK? So enticing words. Now, enticing words are usually used by the immoral, trying to get men to sin. Forward or rebellious words that are resisting God. Flattering to manipulate. Lies. Ever tell a lie? 
So discord, the word discord you're going to write in there. Have you ever sowed discord, trying to get people at each other? Loud, clamorous, boisterous, babbling, slanderous, a multitude of words that you ever just want to say to someone, would you just be quiet and give me some silence? Reveal secrets. Were you ever told a secret and then told someone else? Deceitful, cuts, wounds. You ever been wounded? Proud word goes in there. Proud words. Harsh words that are unkind, disagreeable, and critical. Pours out evil, dishonesty. Whispers right in the word gossip. Causing strife. Contentious, attacking, wounding. A talebearer. Gossip. There is a, a day that um, I was told this story, and I thought, oh, I never heard that story before. And uh, this lady that was telling me about it, I said, oh, I'm going to use that story someday. And so what it was is that this woman came to her pastor and said, you know, pastor, I, I've gossiped. I've said things that I shouldn't say. You know, I, I've even slandered people. What should I do, pastor? He says, let me tell you what to do. You take this pillow, you open it up, and take a feather and put it on every doorstep of those who you have offended. Every doorstep of people in the church, of people in the community, everyone. You take a feather out and you put it on their doorstep and you go to the next one. She did that and she thought, oh, I should feel, you know, better that I did what my pastor said, but she said, I still feel a little guilty. So she went back to the pastor and she says, Pastor, I did what you said, but I, I still feel a little guilty, you know, that I, I gossiped about people. I, you know, I hurt their reputation. What should I do, Pastor? He says, now go back and pick up all those feathers. Oh, she said, the wind has carried them away. They'll be vanished. They'll be gone. That's impossible. He said, so is it with your words. All your words, what you say, it's impossible to put them back in your mouth. They're still there. And ladies, may we understand the lesson that our careless, idle chatter, sharing bad reports, hurt people. And it ought not come out of a woman's mouth. So I'd like for you to look at the list and I'd like for you to circle one thing that needs to be changed in your life. One thing. I didn't finish the list, and while you look at the list, I'm going to have you. It says, um, you're going to write in quarrels, meddler quarrels, boastful. And you who are teenagers here, um, in 2020, Proverbs 2020, it says, curses parents. You can write that in your line. Lying to get things, hypocritical, brawling, arguing, disputing, backbiting, defaming others behind their back. And so I'd like for you to just circle one thing. That you say, you know, Lord, I need to work on this in my life. Now, we would usually say, oh, a foolish woman's words. Oh, that's like Potiphar. You, you know, I'm sure, he, you know, his wife tried to lure and seduce Joseph. That, that's a foolish woman. But also, do you remember the story of Miriam in the Bible? And how Miriam spoke words against the man of God? And for seven days, she was shut out of the camp. And she became leprous for seven days. She was a God-fearing woman. Yet she spoke foolish words. 
So I hope you circled one thing, and I'd like for us to look at the wise woman and how Proverbs talks about words that should come out of our mouth and be spoken, words that are knowledgeable. The Bible says that lips may keep knowledge. You know, ladies, it takes control, doesn't it, to speak right? It takes tactfulness. It takes discretion, knowing what is right and what is wrong, to be able to say, I'm going to speak what's right. Truthful, you're writing that in the line. Truthful and righteous. A mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Let me just remind us that exaggeration are words like never and always. Have we used those? Yes. And we could all raise our hands and say, oh, I've said those words, never and always. Well, that's exaggeration because nothing is ever never and always. Life-giving. Our words are supposed to be like a, a, a well of life, nourishing people, feeding them, blessing them, lifting them up. Ask yourself, do your words revive people? In 1013, it says, speak wisdom. Learn to listen to the meaning of your words, ladies. You know, not always do we speak that others can understand, and we need to be able to say, are my words being understood? Refrains, restrains is the word you're writing in there. The word restrains. It means that I am going to refrain. I'm going to not speak. And sometimes that's hard, isn't it? Words that are valuable. Gossip is not valuable, ladies. Knowledgeable, acceptable, holds her tongue. Be cautious, ladies, that we don't mix our words with our moods. We can change our mood, but we cannot take back our words. And then um, in 15.1, it says a soft answer. You're writing the word answer. I like what Amy Carmichael said. Words are a chance to die to myself and to live unto Jesus. Aren't those great? Words are a chance to die to Jenny Crichton and to live unto Jesus. And then the word of God says in 15.28, to consider how to answer. Um, Hannah, remember how she was praying at the altar and Eli thought that she was drunken because she wasn't saying verbally, she couldn't be heard. Remember how he spoke down to her? And remember her words, he says, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit, and out of the abundance of my heart, my grief ha have I spoken. Ladies, there's going to be people that aren't going to understand your grief and your sorrow. And they may say words that hurt you. And all you can do is say, please, just pray for me. Pleasant words, that's what our theme is about, are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. I don't know if you've ever seen a honeycomb. How many of you have ever had a honeycomb and eaten one? Okay, I've never eaten one, okay? I have one here. I'm going to try this. <laughs> but you know, a honeycomb, bees make their honeycomb homes, and they store their honey in there for the winter. Because in the winter months, they cannot go out and get uh, the flowers to be able to pollinate. And so they s live off their own honey through the winter months. Now, isn't that just like you and I? The bees need to survive and th thrive on their own honey. And you and I need to survive and thrive on the very words of God. 18.13, cautious, listens first. You're writing the word first. Timely, fitting words, gentle words. And then in 31.26, kind words. All of us need to have kind words. I remember the day I um, came up from the basement with a load of laundry. Oh my word, it was so heavy. And I was just, and there sat my husband. He was just sitting down reading a book. And I said, 
Oh, I wish I could read a book, but the only, <laughs> the only books I get to read are textbooks, doing homework with my five kids. Oh, I wish I could read a book. And in my self-pity attitude, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Jenny, that's negative thinking. Oh, it is. That's right, Lord. I'm sorry. You know what, ladies? I'm so glad I didn't talk that day. I'm so glad the Lord held back my words that day, that I didn't condemn my husband. You know what he'd just done? He'd come in from mowing the grass. He was hot, and he was cooling off, and he was just relaxing for a little while. Did I need to relax? But you know what? I was feeling like a martyr. You ever feel like a martyr? Like I have this coming to me, you know, help me out here. <laughs> Ladies, kind words. Sometimes it just takes practice saying kind words. The principle of exchange is what you and I need. We need to put off the wrong words and put on the right words. So let's think of some words you and I need to put off. So we need to put off angry words. So let's say I have angry words on, and uh, I wanted to tell my husband to get off his chair and to lift up the basket and carry it up the next flight of stairs. <laughs> Ever been angry? Oh, our words can get heated sometimes, can't they? But we need to take off the anger, ladies. And we need to replace it with words of appreciation. I know women who are widows. I need to appreciate my husband while we're together. Words of appreciation, words of love, words of respect, words of approval, words of admiration, but listen to this one, words of contentment. Wow. Oh, Lord, this, this basket's so heavy, carrying up, I've got one flight of stairs, I've got to go another flight. Thank the Lord I have two legs. Thank the Lord I have two arms. Thank the Lord I have the strength to be able to climb the steps. You know, contentment's rare today. Those who aren't married wish they were. Those who are married wish that maybe they had a different husband. Women are always wishing that they were a little thinner or a little prettier. Contentment. I encourage you to study out the word and the word of God that we might become more content women. So we need to take off the angry words and put on the words of appreciation. But we also need to take off bitter words. Words that are resentful. Do you ever um, resent someone? And ever get hurt? You and I need to come to the point where we put off those bitter words. But ladies, we can't just take it off. We need to put on. Because if we take off, then we're just, we're just target again for Satan for doing something else putting on us. So we need to replace that with the bitter words, replace it with words of benevolence. What are that? Words of goodwill. Words of generosity and tenderness. Words of compassion. And listen to this one. Words of forgiveness. Let's just say all that word together, ladies. Forgiveness. Let's say it again. Forgiveness. You know, forgiveness is necessary, but it takes a deliberate decision to be forgiving. 
And then it takes words, I am sorry, please forgive me. Or it takes words, I forgive you, forgive me. And ladies, we always need to say, I'm sorry. But then sometimes, the Word of God talks often in the book of Proverbs about a contentious woman. A contentious woman is that kind of woman that's just fuming and hot and heavy all the time. And we need to take off that contention spirit, and we need to put on consideration, forbearance, and patience. We need to put on not being irritable, but being calm. How are you, you at your house? Are you calm? Our choice. Foolish words, wise words. I left the mirror open down there for this reason. We can see our outward appearance in the mirror, but it is the word of God that you and I have a mirror to check the inside of us. And the word of God is our mirror. Just like we look on the outside, this is how we look on the inside of us, through the, for, through the words of God himself. And ladies, I encourage you, be in the word. Know the word, for it's the word of God that sets us on the right course of life. Let's pray. With your eyes closed and your head bowed, I just want to ask you one question. What has the mirror of God's word revealed to you about your words? What has the mirror of God's word revealed to you about your words? You circled some things, I hope. Would you right now, just in the quietness, just say, Lord, change me. Remember what we first said, Lord, whatever you tell me to do or say, I will obey. Lord, how we thank you that you can work in our heart and you can help us to be able to be obedient. Help us to walk pleasing to you, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.